Since animal foods offer far less nutritional value, can they at least make the case that they offer less toxins too? No, sorry. There are a lot more toxins in animal foods than plant foods. Land animals eat grain that has been heavily sprayed and the toxins accumulate in their cells. Fish eat each other and the toxins accumulate as you go up the food chain. And that's why many types of fish have dangerous levels of mercury. So how can anyone possibly believe the nonsense that eating animals is a good idea? One reason is that they hear about nutritional studies. One day they hear about a study that says that eating meat is bad for you, but the next day they hear about a study that says meat is good for you. And people throw up their hands and conclude nutrition is a very controversial subject. Nobody seems to agree on what's healthy. So I'll just keep eating what I've always been eating and what mommy and daddy taught me to eat. With all the evidence and logic against meat eating, how does it happen that we hear that there are some nutritional studies that appear to defend meat eating? Because this is not a struggle between science and science. This is a struggle between science and culture. Culture has the upper hand and it has infiltrated science. Here's how and why nutrition is presented as if it's a controversial subject. First of all, although most nutritional studies come to the same conclusion that eating meat is harmful, given that there are tens of thousands of studies done every year, the laws of probability dictate that some of them are going to contradict others. And the few studies that contradict the established conclusion of the overwhelming body of medical evidence that meat is deleterious to your health, well, those pro-meat studies are the ones that you're more likely to hear about. They make news, just like man meat bites dog makes news. And, they're all, and you're also more likely to hear about them because the meat industry will promote any study that supports them. The broccoli industry isn't as vigilant or as rich. Second, many studies are bought and paid for. Before you believe a study, you need to know if it was paid for by the dairy interest or some animal agriculture interest or some giant agribusiness. The egg industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars funding and promoting studies telling us not to worry about dietary cholesterol. Do you think they lose any sleep worrying over how many people they may be killing with that advice? Many terrible food industries play this game. The candy industry has funded studies allegedly proving <laughs> that candy helps children focus. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? Candy helps create brighter children. I'll bet you didn't know that. How did they prove that? They did a test funded by the Mars Candy Company. They divided children into two cohorts. The first went to school and had candy for breakfast. They were able to focus. The second group was fed essentially nothing. They were hungry. They couldn't focus as well. Hence, candy helps you focus. I'm not making this up. And so you simply can't trust many nutritional studies because the researchers may have an agenda. It's often the case that they're being paid by the industry behind the food being studied. Finally, and maybe most importantly, many nutritional studies on diet are poorly designed, effectively meaningless research. If you hear about a study on 10,000 people that demonstrates this or that about meat eating versus vegetarian versus vegan diets, or outlines the alleged health benefits versus harms of eating animal foods, what you are hearing about is a self-reporting study in which thousands of people simply report what they ate over time. Their reporting is not likely to be very accurate. And since they're free to eat whatever they want, there's no particular style of eating being tested, and the participants are generally not committed to any way of eating, and their diets are likely to shift during the course of the study. We know that a good lawyer can sift through a mountain of evidence to construct a case why their client is innocent. And if you ask the lawyer to switch sides and work for the prosecution, they could use the same set of facts to demonstrate that the accused is guilty. Similarly, if you have a mountain of evidence 
about the wildly varying diets of 10,000 people over a period of months or years, reporting in an undisciplined manner what they remember about what they ate. And none of these people is committed to any particular style of eating, and they develop a whole range of illnesses over time then health researchers who may have an agenda can sift through the data and make it prove whatever they want. The data isn't clear because it's not designed to be clear. Contrast that with the finest studies I know of, the research of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. As mentioned before, his subjects were severely sick heart patients. We know with something approaching statistical certainty, the health outcomes of severely sick heart patients without intervention. It would be perfectly possible to estimate how many more years they would be likely to live and how many more cardiac events they'd be likely to experience without dietary intervention. We have data on millions of heart patients to compare this cohort with. And the good doctor put them on a specific, controlled, low-fat vegan diet. He motivated and monitored them and reported results that were extraordinary for all the patients who stayed compliant with the diet. And he did essentially the same thing a second time with a larger group of heart patients. So there wasn't any vagueness about what they were eating. The data wasn't dependent on the memories of the subjects and their diet wasn't a melange of different eating styles that could be spun a hundred different ways. They were all eating one diet, a whole foods, low fat, oil-free plant-based diet. That is the correct way to do any nutritional research that's meant to focus on the health outcomes of a way of eating. There's a platitude in science that says that a randomized controlled trial is the gold standard in nutritional research. A randomized controlled trial is one in which the population receiving a given dietary protocol or intervention is chosen at random from the eligible population. And a control group is also chosen at random from the same eligible population. That we're supposed to believe is the gold standard. Respectfully, I'm dubious about that because in reality, in these studies, people are not kept in closed quarters and monitored for months and years. Instead, they go home and eat usually with a total degree of freedom and then report what they've eaten. The gold standard should be not a randomized controlled trial. It should be what you might call a motivated controlled trial. It's having subjects highly committed to eating a certain clearly defined diet over a period of time, and they're going to do it, and they're going to report it accurately because they're motivated, they're engaged, and they haven't been assigned at random. If some deluded researchers somewhere believe against a mountain of evidence that eating meat is healthy or eating dairy or eggs is healthy, or if they simply want to believe that because they grew up on a dairy farm or their father was a butcher, here I would tell them, is the, is the legitimate way to conduct research and the, the only way to prove your case. Take one cohort on the reigning champion diet, the Esselstyn diet, and compare health outcomes to people who actually believe in practicing, let's say, the keto diet that you want to test with scrambled eggs and bacon or whatever you believe in. Good luck to you. You're never going to come up with a diet involving animal foods that outperforms the Esselstyn diet, the whole foods, low fat vegan diet. And I'll bet that most researchers know that. So they don't conduct nutritional research in that clear and meaningful way. Instead, they let 10,000 people of all stripes eat whatever they want and ask them to try to remember what they ate, and the researchers get to spin the confusing data and seek to make headlines. It's nonsense. One example of that nonsense, the so-called red meat papers that made headlines in the year 2019. It was published in a formerly respectable medical journal called the Annals of Internal Medicine. The report's conclusion, quote, current levels of meat consumption should be continued. They should not be changed. How did they come to this conclusion? What kind of new study did they do? Did they ask some people to follow a meat-based diet and others to follow a plant-based diet and compare their health outcomes and their longevity? Did they then maybe find that the people eating meat did just as well as the people eating plants? No, of course not, because that could never happen. In fact, they didn't do a new study at all. They reviewed old studies. It's called a meta-analysis. 
the authors put together a panel of 14 members, none of whom had health science backgrounds, and asked them to review nutritional research using certain metrics designed for the analysis of pharmaceutical drugs that are generally inappropriate for nutritional studies. Using those inappropriate metrics, the panel gave a weak grade to all the evidence it reviewed. Still, the panel acknowledged that the evidence showed that red meat consumption was associated with increased risks of heart disease, stroke, cancer, and all-cause mortality. So then why didn't they come out against meat consumption? Because they used an entirely arbitrary point system that they pulled directly out of their asses. Here's what they did. They weighed that, that so-called weak evidence of meat's harms against a more, quote, critically important factor in its grading system. The idea that people do not have a, quote, willingness to change unprocessed red or processed meat consumption. So in other words, the meat-eating diet loses, say, one point for causing more heart disease and cancer and early death, but gains five points for being more convenient for people. So you see, this wasn't a scientific study about what happens to your body when you eat meat. This wasn't a study at all. It was an opinion. That's all it was, an opinion about whether people want to change their diets. The authors simply provided their pointless, unsupported, unsolicited opinion that people don't want to give up meat. They may well be right, but who cares? And how does that get published in a scientific journal? Yet it made headlines around the world that scientists are advising you to continue eating meat. And people understandably assumed that there was some kind of science involved. There was not, no science at all. <laughs>